And yeah, welcome to the club. I love you. I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore Peace, host and producer of Omni U Presents the H3O Art of Life show. And I'm chuckling because my guest is my former teacher and mentor, Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. And we've been having a little chat before the show came up, and I was telling her that the name of the show was Journeying with Margaret, and she says, it's Life with Margaret, because Life with Margaret is the name of her book, the official autobiography of Dr. Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs, which is now available in bookstores and in the libraries. And it is a compilation of her life as well as some of her work. And I'm very happy that she chose to do that because I think many people know you as the co-founder of the DuSable Museum and the Southside Community Arts Center and being a, a prison, having a prison ministry of sorts and being a, a world traveler and an, an, an artist uh, unequaled, I think, in, in, uh, in, your, in, your, in your medium. Thank you, Glow. You're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> but the, the something that I think that most people don't emphasize enough is your poetry, that you are a writer and a poet and that you you change, what did you tell my daughter? You rest by changing activities. So when you have um, tired yourself out painting Reggie. or sculpting, you then you write. You say it in words. Oh, you, know. you say it in words. Mm -hmm. So in this book, Life with Margaret, you have said in words, and in the, the first words you have said, I guess is a charge to all of us, your motto, I am but one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do, and what I ought to do, I will do. This must have been your motto for a very long time when you started a museum in your living room, in your home, or did you start it in your living room? Some part of your house was the well, first home start, of the museum. Well, it started in the living room, yeah. Okay, and, and what gave you that idea? Well, to tell you, this is way back in 1959, being a teacher, and I just couldn't stand the idea of standing in front of a group of eager-eyed young people uh, over there at DuSable High School and not have something positive to say to them about themselves. And we had one teacher whose name, who's bless his soul, he's gone to the other world, and I will not say his name, but <coughs> he taught at DuSable High School. And when I was thinking about plans for starting a museum, he told me, he says, yeah, I don't see why you want to waste your time and energy starting a museum. Colored people haven't done anything to be in any museum. So I said, well, that's your opinion, but mine is otherwise. And I just kept on going in the direction I was going. Mm -hmm. And um, and there were a no number of other teachers who were interested too, and we got together and we formed a little group and we we were having a meeting um, at uh, in the in the um, at, in the coach. I was living in the coach house at the time, and um, well, we, we had to set up a committee saying, well, um, we set up some committees. We set up a committee for finding a place, and uh, so it just it just happened that the building in front, the mansion in front, which was owned by the Quincy Club, became available to sell to, for sale. And my husband Charles and I were able to scrounge up enough money to buy it on contract. And uh, so we said, well, remembering what Booker T said, Booker T said, put on your buckets where you are. So we looked around. There was a living room and all, so we moved out all the furniture. And I wrote to uh, the big museums like Science and Industry and the Art Institute and asked them if they had some empty cases, some cases that they would give to us. Mm -hmm that we were starting a black history museum, and they were kind enough to give us th these cases. We put whatever we had to exhibit up in them, and we put a sign on the door saying, we called it first Ebony Museum, because mm -hmm. Ebony means black, and people would get the, wor get the word immediately what it was about. Mm -hmm. But then we were located at 3806 South Michigan, and Ebony Magazine was 1800 South Michigan, mm -hmm. and we started getting their mail. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I would run and put it back in the mailbox. And then uh, people got the idea that we belonged to Ebony Magazine and we didn't need any money. So Ebony Magazine's attorney wrote me a letter and they said, uh, 
you, you, uh, you, you must be prohibited from using the name Ebony as a title of your venture. Well, really, what insulted me most was that he called it a venture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they threatened to take legal processes. So I said, well, okay, let them go ahead. And I wrote them a letter saying, the word Ebony is an adjective, and uh, nobody has a patent on the use of the word on, uh, on an adjective, Ebony. And uh, we are not in the process of printing any magazines or books, so what's the problem? Mm -hmm. So I sent them that letter. I never did get any answer back. But I figured if they continued it, it would give us a lot of wide publicity, which would have been very good for us anyhow, and let people know that we did have the museum. Mm -hmm. So in time, we decided to change it to the Museum of African American History. And then we received a lot of communications from African countries, and they would say, uh, the Museum of African American History. So we got the idea. And then shortly thereafter, every so often, uh, people in our community would contact the mayor about having a suitable monument to Jean Baptiste Point du Sable, who was the first settler in the area that became Chicago. And so the mayor set up a committee for that. And I was on the committee. I was on the, uh, s the site committee. And it had one meeting, and then nothing happened. And so finally, um, I got the idea that if we, g we got this building in the park to expand into, that it would be named as a principal monument to DuSable. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's how that came about. And that's how we were able to get the building, because we contacted the mayor and he contacted the park district. So that we, when we asked for the building, we were able to get the building. And so we named it after Jean Baptiste Point DuSable. And that sort of fixed things up so that there was at least one monument, proper monument to DuSable mm -hmm. in, in Chicago. So very briefly, that's something about it. Very mm -hmm. briefly. That's a good very, very briefly. briefly. How long were you teaching? I taught at DuSable for 27 years from 19, um, was 1946, I guess, to 1968. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's 22 years. And then in 1968, because there was a need for some black teachers at the Wilson Junior College, and the, the students were raising a lot of ruckus about it. I got a call in the middle of the night asking if I would like to come over there and teach humanities. And so they said they would give me a couple thousand dollars more a year than what I was making. And so I said, yeah, okay. <laughs> and so I went over to, to Wilson Junior College, which is now um, Kennedy King. And I was over there for 10 years one of the best 10 years of my life. It, during that 10 year period, I was also working at the museum. I would work at the museum from nine until three, and then from four until seven, I would go over to the college and teach my class in humanities. And then of course, in 1985, um, when, when uh, Harold Washington appointed me to be a commissioner on the Chicago Park Board, and some people brought up the idea that it would be a conflict of interest if I remained director of the museum and also was a commissioner. So I, I realized that I would be able to serve our, our museum and our people best if I was a commissioner, which is over all the museums mm -hmm. in the parks, than just being director of the South Museum. So I chose to become emeritus, and that is what I am now, a commissioner on the Chicago Park Board, because I was then reappointed by Mayor Daley for two terms. And my term just ex uh, expired April 25th of this month. And I am asking people to write the mayor and ask him to reappoint me to another term as a commissioner on the Chicago Park Board. Here, here. Mm -hmm. Because you've done some very good work while you have been commissioner. One of the things that I know that you had a, had a lot to do with, if not everything to do with, was the gallery at the South Shore. Oh, that's right. That's right. Uh, South Shore Cultural Center, which used to be a Jewish residence home. And uh, so we were able to, uh, the Park District was thinking about tearing it down. No, somebody was trying to buy it. So we were able to convince the Park District to buy it mm -hmm. and to make it into the cultural center. Mm -hmm. This was the first cultural center established because prior to that, everything was uh, sports and team games and, you know, one team against another team. And so me, me, being myself an artist and a cultural person and being the only commissioner on that commission that was an artist or a cultural person, most of them were all uh, lawyers or business people, uh, I started promoting the idea of developing some facilities which would 
have as its main focus culture, mm -hmm. art, music, literature, poetry, and so forth, dance, and theater. And so South Shore Cultural Center was the first one that we established. Also, I think, but now there's about 12 facilities that are deal sp specifically with cultural things in the Chicago parks. So that's a good r reason enough for you to have another term as a park district commissioner. Well, I should have another term because I've been doing a very good job. You've been <laughs> doing a very good job and you've done some very innovative things, mm -hmm. which I think is are commendable. And I vote for you. Okay. And we will tell all of our listeners to write a letter just, to the mayor. Just drop, drop a, drop dear, a dear postcard. Richie, a little note or something. Right. And, and make sure that he understands that we support Dr. Burroughs as commissioner of the Chicago Park District. And we need her. Mm -hmm. And we want her. And now we want her to tell us about this, this book and who was able to get her to sit down <laughs> long enough to compile a book. Well, there's a a publishing company, an African American publishing company called In Time Publishing. All right. And they contacted me and asked about it. And so, so you said all right. I figured I I didn't have time to write, you know, do it all myself. So, consulting with them, they put it all together, and I think they did a very good job. Okay. Well, I see that in in the very early pages, there's a list of some of the poems that you yourself have written, and. Uh, I know that Paul Robeson is one of the people whom you admire most, and I see that you have. One he of my was inspirations. Our big Paul, so tell us something about Paul, and if you care to read the poem that you wrote in his honor. Well, um, I think I was, I was uh, 17 years old when I first heard him and met him, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, meeting him, that affected my whole life, and has a whole lot to do with what I have done with my life mm -hmm. and the things I have done um, because he was such an inspirational person. And I remember he sang at the orchestra hall and my uncle, Louis Pierre, bought me a ticket to hear Paul Robeson sing. And I went down the first time I'd been to a concert or anything like that. And uh, he was there with his wife and his son. And they had a receiving line at the end of the program. And so I had never been in a receiving line before. I didn't even know what a receiving line was, but everybody was getting up in the line, so I got in the line too. No, I think this was at a reception that they had afterwards at the Appomattox Club on 36th and uh, it was called Grand Boulevard then, mm -hmm. later South Parkway, now King Drive. And so I got up in the receiving line. And when I got up to Mr. Robeson, you know, I got his hand, I couldn't let go. I was just sort of stunned. So <laughs> all I can say is, Mr. Robeson, we're really proud of you. We're really proud of you. Because you see, he was the first black person I had ever seen that what one could admire greatly, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, his inspiration has stuck with me all through life and on up until today. And he's really responsible for many of the things that I've done, even like starting a museum. He was very encouraging in that. And so, that's why I wrote a poem. I've written two poems about him. It's a long poem and then a shorter poem, which I often share with, with the school children whenever I go to speak to them. So you want me to read the... I want you to read your ropes and poems. What page is that? 105. He was our big Paul. Yeah, this is one that I wrote especially for, for the little children to... Uh, to uh, know something about him. And I had the honor uh, during the uh, 1950s of that McCarthy period when he became sort of a marked man and many concert halls refused to uh, present him. Uh, we had the honor of having him up at our studio at 3806 South Michigan. And so the picture that you see there in the book of me is and you and Paul. Great Paul Robeson. Mm. He was our big Paul the man for whom they named the mountain. He is the pride and joy of our people. He was our big Paul Robeson. He was a lover of people. He was a helper of people. He was a worker for peace among the nations and peoples of the world. He was a scholar and a singer. He was an actor and an athlete. He spoke and studied many languages. And whatever he tried to do, he did it to the best of his ability. Excellence was always big Paul Robeson's goal. He was a big, warm, and friendly kind of man. Big, 
yet cuddly as a teddy bear. He was endowed with a fine, healthy body, and he kept it that way. He was endowed with an alert, inquiring mind, and he took great joy in reading and learning. I bet you would have liked Big Paul. You would have liked him to be your father or your uncle or your grandfather. You would have liked him to be in your family. Well, he is. For as long as his spirit lives, and it will, Big Paul Robeson, the man for whom they named the mountain, will live. He will live in my family. He will live in your family. He will live in all of our families. He will live in our hearts, for he is the pride and joy of our people. He is Big Paul Robeson, the man for whom they named the mountain. And a note says, in the Soviet Union, the Soviets named the mountain in Kyrgyzia to honor Paul Robeson. And of course, as we all know, he passed away in 1976. We did a, a, did a campaign to try to uh, get the government and the post office to uh, create a stamp for his, um, the 100th anniversary of his birth, which was eight, 1998. And though we sent many letters and petitions and everything like that, they still did not see fit to do it. But he, li he will live in our hearts. Of course. You um, have two versions of one of my favorite works. What is that? What Shall I Tell My Children, who are black. Mm -hmm. And then you have What Shall I Tell My Children for the New Millennium. Before you read, would you tell me why you updated the first one? Well, the point is, uh, What Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Black? That was written way back in 19, 1963, I think. I wrote it in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. And so about every 10 years, I would ask, ask a question like, what shall I tell my children? Um, uh, um, I, I've done several. You did, what shall I tell my children who are white? <laughs> no, I didn't do that one. Okay. Mr. Who? Eugene Fellman, one of our co-founders okay. who was white, okay. he was a co-founder of DuSable Museum, he wrote that one. All right. After he read mine, and he wrote that one. But the funny thing about it is that we both tell them the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I and saw it in the context of what shall I tell my children mm -hmm. who are black and I associated it with and, you. And uh, I've written one, and uh, what shall I, I, I wrote one recently that I wrote for teenagers, what shall I tell my children about uh, unprotected sex? Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And I read that sometimes when I meet, uh, high speak school to students. high school youngsters, mm -hmm. you know, Okay. So forth. Well, what shall I tell my children who are black of the is right up here on page five. You want to hear that? You want to hear that? I love one? that. I read it to you. Okay. I love this poem. You want to read it to me? No, you I want read you. it to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what shall I tell my children who are black of what it means to be a captive in this dark skin? What shall I tell my dear one, fruit of my womb, of how beautiful they are? even when everywhere they turn, they are faced with abhorrence of everything that is black. The night is black, and so is the boogeyman. Villains are black with black hearts. A black cow gives no milk. A black hen lays no eggs. Bad news comes bordered in black. Morning clothes, black. Storm clouds, black. Black is evil, and evil is black, and devil's food is black. What shall I tell my dear ones raised in a white world, a place where white has been made to represent all that is good and pure and fine and decent? Robed in white and cotton candy and ice. There's a line missing here, Dr. Ice Pease. cream. Mm -hmm. What's missing here? And Where angels are robed in white. Yeah, angels robed in white. And heaven is a white place with angels it, robed in white. Yeah. And cotton candy and ice cream and milk and ruffled Sunday dresses and dream houses and long sleek Cadillacs and angels food is white, all, all white. What can I say therefore when my child comes home in tears because a playmate has called him black? big-lipped, flat-nosed, and nappy-headed. What will he think when I dry his tears and whisper, yes, 
that's true, but no less beautiful and dear. How shall I lift up his head, get him to square his shoulders, look his adversaries in the eye, confident in the knowledge of his worth, serene under his sable skin, and proud of his own beauty? What can I do to give him strength that he may come through life's adversities as a whole human being, unwarped and human in a world of biased laws and in human practices, that he might survive. And survive he must, for who knows, perhaps this black child here bears the genius to discover the cure for cancer or to chart the course for exploration of the universe. So he must survive for the good of all humanity. He must and will survive. I have drunk deeply of late from the fountain of my black culture, sat at the knee and learned from Mother Africa, discovered the truth of my heritage, the truth so often obscured and omitted. And I find I have much to say to my black children. I will lift up their heads in proud blackness with the stories of their fathers and their fathers' fathers. And I shall take them into a way back time of kings and queens who ruled the Nile and measured the stars and discovered the laws of mathematics upon whose backs have been built the wealth of two continents. Three continents. Three continents. Europe. Europe. Africa. Africa. And America. And America. I will tell him this and more and his heritage shall be his weapon and his armor, will make him strong enough to win any battle he may face. And since this story is often obscured, I must sacrifice to find it for my children, even as I sacrifice to feed, clothe, and shelter them. So this I will do for them if I love them. None will do it for me. I must find the truth of heritage for myself and pass it on to them. In years to come, I believe, because I have armed them with the truth, my children and their children's children will venerate me, for it is the truth that will make us free. You read very beautifully. I love this poem. You read beautifully. Thank you very kindly. Now your turn, you need to read the new millennium. Which, what, which it's page? page 169. 169. I had to write a poem for the new millennium. Everybody talking about the millennium, so <laughs> I said, I got to do one, too. Let's see, I'll get it. It says, The Legacy of a Woman Epilogue. This is the first poem that I wrote on entering the new millennium. What shall I tell my children for the new millennium? What shall I tell my children for the new millennium? What shall I tell my children, my black, white, red, brown, and yellow rainbow family? And what shall I tell you of my visions, my hopes, and my prayers for the millennium and beyond? What shall I tell them? This is what I will tell my children, and this is what I will tell you of my visions, my hopes, and my prayers for the future of God's rainbow family. I will repeat for them the desires, the aims, and goals which I have strived and struggled to achieve and for which I have devoted my life to for over five, over three score years and 10 to realize and to achieve. It is my vision, my hopes, and my prayers that at long last, these aims and goals may become a reality, hopefully, in the few remaining years of my life. I will tell my children and I will tell you that it is my vision, my hope, and my prayer that there will be in the year 2000 and beyond an end to homelessness, an end to ignorance, and an end to racism. That brothers will cease to fight against brother. That all the swords in the world will be beaten into plowshares. It is my vision, my hope, and my prayer that the voices of all the people of God's rainbow family will be joined together in one grand symphonic chorale of exaltation, joy, and praise to the omnipotent higher power, God, Jesus, Allah, Jehovah, Nayami, Bodhisattva, Buddha, or whatever name the spirit is deemed to be called by. It is my vision, my hope, and my prayer 
that all the people of the world, all the mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, aunts, uncles and cousins, will become appreciative of each other's unique differences and will become imbued with empathy and compassion toward one another and will realize and respect the oneness which is shared by all of the children of God's rainbow family. This then is my vision, my hope, and my prayer. And what I will tell my children and the children of God's rainbow family and what I will tell you for the millennium years and beyond, which I hope may become a reality in the few remaining years of my lifetime. It is my vision, my hope, and my prayers that all of God's rainbow family may arrive at the point of living together, creating together, and working together in peace, harmony, and goodwill throughout the world. This is my vision, my hope, and my prayer. And is this note at the bottom intended to be a part of that? Or is no, that's, that's, that's a part of the next piece. That's referring to Charles' okay. poem. Charles wrote poetry also, you know. No, I didn't know Charles wrote oh, yeah. poetry well, I'll, also. I'll have to see that you get a copy of uh, his book of poems that we brought out. All right. So your vision, your hope, and your prayers for universal oneness. That's it. You see, you rem remember the first version is, what should I tell my children who are black? Mm -hmm. But now I'm talking... All children are my children. Mm -hmm. Black, white, red, brown, and yellow. Mm -hmm. All of our people. Mm -hmm. So you are the mother of all of these children, <laughs> and you are telling them what it is your, their mother wants them to do. I would like to do one other for you. I would love to have you do one or two or three others. Well, I just do one. One, you know, after all. Which one is this? Page 44. Okay. And this is one I very often um, read to the young people. Okay. Advice to the youth, be yourself, be what you are. You are unique, you are precious. There's no one else like you. You are special, be happy. Be happy with yourself just as you are. Tall, short, plump, slim. Skin, black, white, red, brown, or yellow. Eyes, black, brown, blue, gray, or green. Lips full, thin, or in between, be yourself. Be exactly what you are. Be yourself. Love yourself. You are unique. You are rare. You are precious. Be yourself. And you know, I think you have lived by that all your life because I remember as a student at DuSable High School <laughs> in your art class, <laughs> I remember... <laughs> that you were yourself. You were an artist. There was no question about it. And I you not... I, I you thought you were going to say that I, I wore my hair natural. Well, I know that you I wore, wore your hair. You, you did wear your hair natural. I was natural. one of the first people with a college degree and certainly teacher to go natural. I just got tired of it. But, you know, the thing about it was that you did it with conviction. You know, mm -hmm. there, there... I can remember... You know, this whole thing about hair <laughs> has plagued Isn't black something? women throughout their lives. Isn't it something? And so it was always, uh, you know, someone was always judging and critiquing your hair, and you had to worry <laughs> about your kitchen, and you had to worry <laughs> about your edges, you know, and, and if you went swimming, I, I almost failed uh, <laughs> physical education because I cut uh, the swimming class so often. Mm -hmm. Every Monday we had to swim. Mm -hmm. And of course I went to the hairdresser every two weeks. That's and right. so I couldn't dare go on a Saturday and go get in that swimming pool on a Monday. And so <laughs> Mondays I would just disappear when it was time to go swimming, which means that, you know, I was deprived of the pleasure of, of enjoying swimming, learning to swim and, and yes. enjoying swimming. But the, the whole thing was that there was so much emphasis on hair, t far too much emphasis well, on I hair. Well, think, I think it's similar today. You know, when I walk around looking at people with all the, and, and uh, you know, I didn't know that uh, colored people was born with blonde hair. Did you? Well, I guess <laughs> we must have some because I see quite a few. But, but like, the, the thing is that we are not, accepting of ourselves we are not being ourselves just as we are right just as we are it's, it's as though God has made some kind of mistake and you know <laughs> didn't really mean to make people different colors and didn't mean to give people different textures of hair and 
different colors of eyes. It's as though God had a standard and and you are falling too far away from the standard so you have to you have to <laughs> do something to yourself and it were it not for the kinds of things that that women do have to do that actually uh to, they actually mutilate themselves in some cases. They abuse themselves with very harsh chemicals, which is unhealthy. Well, so that's that. But the thing was that t that subject that you are now is a whole other program. I know, but I was <laughs> going to say the thing was that you walked down the halls and in and out of your classroom and everywhere. I saw you looking as though the people who were staring were they were the ones with the problem because you certainly didn't have <laughs> one which was very good for little black girls who were growing up with that kind of hair on their head to feel like it was all right to have that kind of ha hair growing out of their scalp so we we must recognize that young people are patterning themselves after us in many cases and the behaviors that we, they see us engage in uh, kind of validate certain kinds of behaviors that, that they can behave, that they can, can also, as far as I'm concerned, you were a pioneer in that regard, and so I thank you for it. But yeah. <laughs> at any rate... People thought I was crazy. I don't know. No, well, see, no one <laughs> ever had a discussion with any of us, but I just know that one thing about it, you were free. Mm -hmm. Even then, you were free because you were free to be who you were, and you knew it, you know. And, and of course, um, I don't know how long you had been an, an artist then, so you were an educator, so you apparently... I was an artist since a little kid. So you're from, from a little kid, so the educator thing was to, to have a career that was in a profession. I mean, and the uh, artist thing was I what you really, who you really are. Okay. Because you know, when I graduated from high school, uh, I, I, I didn't have any money to go to the art institute. But, uh, and I realized that most of the people who went to the art institute were the wealthy white kids from the North Shore, and they didn't really have to sell paintings. Mm -hmm. At that time, color folks weren't buying no paintings. Mm -hmm. So I decided then I said, well, I'll take art education, mm -hmm. and I can teach art. Mm -hmm. And I'll be able to eat mm -hmm. and still carry on my paintings. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. Because so, you, so you, that's how I became an art teacher. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then you you taught 22 years yeah, at about 20, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, but you didn't. 22 good years. Did mm -hmm. you retire after that? No, I I, I went from uh, Dusable over to Wilson Junior College. Okay, right. For, for the years. humanities. Yeah. For another 10 years. For 10 years. And yeah. then you retired after that. No. Yes. Uh, I retired from teaching in 1979. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when did you become a park district commissioner in the 80s? 80, I guess 86. 86. 86. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you also have the prison ministry. You said you go to jail every Tuesday and Absolute, every Sunday. Absolutely. And you teach art classes. I teach art and poetry. In which mm -hmm. prisons? Well, now we're currently at Stateville. You're, mm -hmm. you're currently at Stateville. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for the past dozen years or so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you travel. Where is your most recent uh, visit? Uh, I went to Israel in December. Okay. Mm -hmm. How long were you there? Just, it was just about 10 days. Mm -hmm. Oh, just a short time. <laughs> <laughs> and where do you envision going next? Well, I just, I was in, last month I was in Cuba. <laughs> last month you were in Cuba? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see, because now in, uh, in retirement and everything like that, my main challenge is keep on doing what I'm doing and to travel. Okay. Travel is many. I want to visit every country. Well, on the, on the African continent, there are 50, about 50 countries. I've done half of them. I've got okay. 25 more to go. So you see, I have no time to die. All right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to visit uh, more Euro European countries. I've been to the Soviet Union. I've been to Japan. I've been to China. and. You know, I just want to travel, go see for myself. And you often take people with you when you travel. Yeah, well, uh, I'm, I'm usually the escort for Eleanor uh, Chapman's Mahogany Travel, mm -hmm. um, African Travel Advisors mm -hmm. Tours, and that's how I get a chance to go on many of these trips and take people with me. Mm -hmm. And I think that every person, every person, black or white, should take at least one trip to Africa, even if it's just one weekend. I think, well, mm -hmm. it would be a disservice to go for a weekend. But I mean, even if they, that's all they can afford, but to go. And um, 
you know, you can, you know, people spend money going to Las Vegas and going to places like that. And it'd be better to take that money and take a trip to Africa, take, take a trip home to see where it'll, it'll change you, it'll strengthen you, you know. But if we, in order to get more people interested in, in going into Africa, they have to, they have to, some of the myths about Africa have to be dispelled. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because many times people don't know what they will encounter. They think and, it's jungles and yeah, stuff. Yeah, and, and they think of Tarzan movies. And they don't know how transforming that experience is. There's just something about landing in the airport, you know, the, stepping off that home. plane on African home. soil, something home. happens to you. You're home. Yes, yes. And then, of course, to be among your own people. Absolutely. You find out that we are not a minority. No, absolutely These people not. have us thinking we're a minority. You're not a minority. You know, when we were in Senegal together, do you remember when they had the power outages because of, they have socialized medicine and the doctors had gone on strike? And so the other people, the other workers went on strike in support of the doctors. And so there was this power outage. And had that happened, and this is in Dakar, if that had happened in any city in the United States, it would have been pandemonium. But we walked out every night and walked in the darkness Up the to, the, to the restaurant mm -hmm. and had dinner by candlelight. No, next morning when daylight came up, there were no broken windows. There were no, uh, uh, there was just absolutely no pandemonium, no bedlam, no vandalism. Life went on as usual. Mm -hmm. The women were still walking to get the water with the, con the vessels on their head. And every night, there were no lights except the lights on the vehicles and the lights in the hotels that had generators, which this kind of dispels the notion that Africa is this wild place, you know, where people are running around, you know, assaulting uh, other people, you know. Well, it's very interesting that you, in the African countries I visited, you don't see police and squad cars racing all around and everything like that. Mm -hmm. and, and people have the law and order and everything like that. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't see all of that. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting. Yes, it is very interesting. I would certainly urge everybody listening or looking on to put it into their future plans to take at least one trip home. Of course. Mm -hmm. or may, uh, perhaps take one trip as a exploratory. If you go once, you'll go back. Yes, you will. <laughs> yes, you will. And if you go once, you want it, you'll want to convert everybody and, and want them to go back. Mm -hmm. Now, for many years, you were married to Charles Burroughs. And you have told me today that he was a poet as well. And I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. So tell me something about this very interesting man. I've seen him so many times. Well, Charles, Charles uh, was born in New York, and um, his mother was a member of the New York Teachers Union. But she was a very progressive person. In fact, you, she was even referred to as communistic. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, uh, she was separated from a job in the New York school system. Mm -hmm. And so she took um, two of her sons, her two younger sons, and she went over to the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And she got a job there as a ra uh, broadcaster for Radio Moscow. And those boys were over there for 17 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Charles went to school over there and all like that, he and his brother Neil. And then I think in... Um, then his mother had to come come back because of illness and all. She came back to New York and brought them back. They were they were grown now. They were about in their twenties, and uh, so mother passed and all. And then and Charles and his brother went on a came on a speaking tour uh, throughout the country about life in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And it was at a lecture that he gave in Chicago that I met him mm -hmm. and was medi immediately impressed. You know how good looking he was. Wouldn't be hard. <laughs> you know how good looking he was. Yes. And we started corresponding. By, by this time, I had be, be, been, been divorced from my first husband, which was Bernard Goss. And um, so we did this correspondence, and I suggested he come to Chicago and, you know, get Visit to know each you. other better. And so, which we did. And when we 
he came and we, I asked him if he would marry me. And Did he you said, okay. really? Oh, yeah, I proposed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't let that get by me. <laughs> and uh, he said yes. And so we, fortunately, we were married over 40 years. Very know, good. Over 40 years. Good choice. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted you to tell me now about some of the people whom I know to have been people who were your friends and associates. I, I know about Frank London Brown, Gwendolyn Brooks, Gus Savage, Oscar Brown Jr., All probably those. Oscar Brown <coughs> Sr. Well, I knew Mr. Senior, but I, I you know, I, I didn't know him. Didn't personally. you have a writer's workshop at your home at one time? We Dr. had, uh, we had a writer's workshop that would meet at the Southside Community Arts Center, and Inez Cunningham Stark Bolton, a white white lady, who worked with Poetry Magazine, was the teacher of it, and Gwendolyn was in that, and um, Robert Davis, myself, and. Uh, Cunningham, I forget, I forget her first name. But a, a number of the people who became outstanding as writers were all in that writer's workshop. We would meet every Wednesday night at the Southside Community Arts Center. And uh, she encouraged us, and, and certainly she <coughs> encouraged a person like Gwendolyn. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <coughs> and at that time, we all worked, all of us artists and writers, we all worked very closely together. Um, Many of the black artists would go off to New York somewhere they could make some money or something other. Mm -hmm. We didn't we didn't make much money in Chicago, but we had this fellowship and comradeship, which was really much more enriching than money. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and we were supportive of each, of each other. Anytime any one of us won a prize or something like that, we'd have a party where we'd in, 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 entertain and feed all the other artists. You know, out mm -hmm. of the, whatever the award was. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I remember. It, and, and I remember this having something to do with you when Frank London Brown had written Trumbull Park uh, about his experiences in that housing development. Someone put a snake in his mailbox and all of that because that was uh, an integration uh, mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. And he was called to New York to appear on the Today Show. And we were all just so excited that he had you know, that he was receiving this neck recognition mm -hmm. and that this book was getting all of this attention. It seems to me I see you in that, in that context, that uh, we were all somewhere and we were all celebrating that, that he had gotten this, this, uh, this award. Mm -hmm. Was uh, Herman Cromwell Gilbert part of yeah, that he, group he at was, any he point? Was among, he was among the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Gus Savage, some way, you and, and Gus Savage were friends? Mm-hmm. Hoyt Fuller and, okay. and that group. He had a group, uh, I forget the name but of Gus the group. Gus was there. not a, he was not an artist, so he was just, you all were just, just, I guess, political allies. Politi you fought in the same I causes. I guess you'd say political allies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You've known, you knew Tim Black, of course. <laughs> uh, who could not live, who could live well, in Chicago? Tim and I and taught Tim together Black. at DuSable High School. I don't remember Tim teaching at DuSable. Well, uh, he was it there. It was at the same time, during those same years? Uh, what years were you there? I was there in 1945. Oh, uh, I think You weren't there yet. You came next year. I came in 1946. Right. So, mm -hmm. but he was there at some, at some point during the time you were teaching yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness gracious, he must have been teaching the social sciences because that's his background. History. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, he didn't tell me that. He kept trying to tell me he was older than me, but I didn't <laughs> really get the message on that. Did you know Harold Washington early on? Well, I, I knew, uh, I taught um, Ramon Price, his half-brother. Yes. And... I certainly I knew of Mr. Washington, but I did not know him as as closely as I knew Ramon, <coughs> whom I taught at DuSable High School. Yes, I know, because Ramon and I were in the same division. We were in the McLeod division. Mm -hmm. And who and later, we, came, when he came out of the Army, he went to the Art Institute and um, finished. And then he was he was my practice student at DuSable High School. He did his practice teaching under me. And then I understand he went to he was going to the University of um, Indiana, and uh, 
we persuaded him at some point to come and be the curator at the DuSable Museum. A wise choice. Which he came and uh, was there with us for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That He was one of your protégés. Who are some of the others that you would think that you had some influence on their careers besides my daughter, Deborah Hand, who claims you as a mother? I don't know. I can't name any. I, I try to encourage young people wherever they are, right. wh whatever they're doing. So there are probably many, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, there are many. And, and I'm sure that, that uh, if I asked most of the artists that I know, they would all tell me that in some way you have inspired their careers or facilitated their careers if, if, Hopefully. By, if by no, in no other way except to have the Southside Community Arts Center be a venue and the South Shore Cultural Center be a venue for their exhibits. But isn't it wonderful that the South uh, Side Community Art Center is over 60 years in existence. Isn't it a miracle? I think that's wonderful. And it was the first, it was one of 50 that was started under the uh, Roosevelt administration, the WPA. And it's the only one remaining. And I bought the first painting that I ever bought, because you said black people don't buy art. When one of the things about um, being poor, as opposed to poor, <laughs> <laughs> Art is a luxury for you. You know, you consider it a luxury. You f you figure you got to pay the rent and buy the kids' school shoes and you know and food and whatnot. And so you don't really think that you can indulge in such luxuries. But the first painting I ever bought was at the Southside Community Arts Center, and it was by Arlene Turner Crawford, mm -hmm. and it was called, it is called, Truth is on the Horizon. Outst outstanding artist. And when I saw that, it spoke to my heart. And I was just there on a visit. You know, you just could go to the Southside Community Arts Center and just walk around and, and enjoy beauty without owning it. Mm -hmm. But when I saw that, I knew good, that good. I had to have it. And I didn't know who she was. And later I found out that she actually worked where I was working. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I, she has told me since then that I, she was new. It was, it was new for her to, to do art and exhibit, and it was encouraging to, you know, to have someone buy her work. And Absolutely. I suppose with every artist, to have your work embraced, you know, have somebody actually buy it, it and place some value on it must be important. So what do, do you ever think you'll write a poem uh, called What Will I t Shall I Tell My Children Who Are Artists? Mm -hmm. What would you tell your children who are artists, Dr. Barnes? No, Barros? I'm thinking of doing one. <coughs> I spoke at the Avalon Park uh, Elementary School today, this morning, and um, I was asking some of the young people to tell me, what are you going to be when you grow up? identify your dream, what is your goal in life? And uh, I decided I'm going to try to put that into form of a poem, mm -hmm. you know, for them to, because I think it's very important that young people should get in their, in their, in their mind at an early age what they want to do, what, mm -hmm. what, what you're going to do with your life, you mm -hmm. know? How mm -hmm. are you, what kind of a contribution are you going to make? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times the, the, the little fellows will say, I want to be a basketball player. I said, well, what if you break your leg mm -hmm. and you can't play basketball? Mm -hmm. And there's only room for one Michael Jordan, and he's here already, you know, and to make them begin thinking about that. Right. So then they said, well, I, I want to be a teacher. I want to be a policeman. I want to be a fireman, as long as they want to be something. Mm -hmm. And they can change. And they can change their mind. They can change later on, but as mm -hmm. long as they have some goal that they move toward. And in this poem, I want to suggest that once you identify your goal, your aim in life, Move toward it. Don't let nobody discourage you. Mm -hmm. Mama, Papa, children, friends, or nothing. Mm -hmm. Don't let nobody discourage you. And just keep going straight toward it, and you'll achieve it. And I wish, too, that some way that uh, the message can be communicated to parents to let children become. Because so often parents have goals for their children. They, you know, we're trying to mold them. We're trying to send them off in the direction. We want them to do the things that are safe. You know, for example, an artist if an artist decides that that is what they will do for a living, may have some difficulty or may have a pause 
where mm -hmm. they are not actually able to take care of themselves financially. So as you said, you took art education so that you could teach art and then enable yourself to be able to practice art at the same time. But I do wish that we could communicate to parents that children have something within them that is motivating them in a direction. And if we could just allow Encourage, the flower to, look, to bloom. I realize just a little, when I first came to DuSable, you know, I'm a people person. I got to touch you. You know, I got to touch you, you know. <laughs> and so I came, some of my students would, um, I would meet one of my students and I would put my hand out to pat them on the shoulder and they would jump back. Then I realized that whenever a hand came to that kid, it was a slap. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I guess today I wouldn't be able to teach because you, you, can't, you, you can't touch them or nothing these days. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, just a little bit of encouragement. Mm -hmm. um, I remember, I think I was about five years old, and my mother noticed that I was making these little stick drawings, stick figure drawings and all. And mm -hmm. my mother said, oh, that's good. She put it up on the wall. She said, you know, you're going to be the artist in the family. Okay. Became the artist. All right. Just a little encouragement. Okay. And to many parents, just a little encouragement to their children. You know, um, and I believe in you. Mm -hmm. I, I know you can. I know you can do it. Mm -hmm. so it'll make all the difference in the world. Mm -hmm. You have a dedication here from your daughter. Plant a seed mm -hmm. within the ground. I see her. Yeah, that picture. was about the museum. Okay. Mm -hmm. You have children. You have two children. I had two, uh, one natural okay. child, which is Gail. All right. And then Paul, whom I adopted, okay. uh, because uh, Gail was uh, fathered by Bernard, my first husband. Mm -hmm. And so when I married Charles, you know, I, I was not able then to have any more children. And I wanted him to have the sense of being a father, so we adopted Paul. Mm -hmm. So you and he was two and a half years old. And he tells me now he's 50. I don't see how he got to be 50, and I'm only 39. Well, that's uh. one of those miracles. <laughs> <laughs> so you are able to, as they say, balance a career and a family mm -hmm. all at the same time, and uh, didn't raise any juvenile delinquents, mm -mm. and were able to stay within a marriage for 40 years. That's a long time, Dr. Barrows to be able to keep it together, especially with someone like you who is absent a lot from the, the present, you know, because mm -hmm. as an artist, I'm sure you required some, t some solitude, you know. Paint, to paint requires that you have some space, mm -hmm. and to write requires that you have some space. So what is your advice to those people who want to pursue those, the arts and, and want to also have families? You know, how do you keep the other people knowing that you, they are loved? I don't know. You don't know. You just, you just went ahead. I can't, I can't answer that. Can't answer that question. Were you, were you a cook? Were you a no, housekeeper? Not, not, not kind, no, no, no kind of cook. Charlie did the cooking. Okay. He was a very good cook, too. Okay. Um, and, and all that, that, that house business. I'm, that house business, you know, that's, that's somebody else's. I just spend that time painting and writing. Right. You do better. Mm -hmm. You do those things better. Any, anybody can keep the house clean and do that cleaning. Okay. But not everybody can write poetry or paint. Or paint. <laughs> and you were named by President Carter, was it? as one of the foremost African-American artists in the, in the country? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And you've got a, a honorary doctorate. You've got more than one. You've got several. S well, several. Num oh, you know from, the, the, from the principal institutions in this country. Well, you know, it's sort of nice to get some flowers while you can smell them. That's true. And there have been, you, I'm, when I look at the back of this book, I just didn't bring up all this stuff because you have all these awards and honors. You have pages and pages. You have pages of, there's a catalog of your works, and it, it just go. Th this is really cute. You got a dollar prize for, draw for a drawing of Abraham Lincoln and the Herald and the Examiner. That was the first. In 1933. That was the first, yeah, that, that was the first, I think I was um, 1933. Well, how old was I? 
Well, anyhow, I was a teenager, <laughs> and uh, that was the year that I graduated from high school. And they had this contest in the paper. Mm -hmm. You know, if you copy this, draw me and send it in. And uh, I drew it and, and won a dollar. My goodness. And I guess that was one of the things that propelled me to continue on into my art career. That mm -hmm. you won this prize. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are just pages in this book, Life with Margaret, which is published by End Time P Publishing and is available at bookstores and in the library. Just the, the just in the appendices, you have all these pages of war, awards and honors, and all these organizations that you belong to. You know, just innumerable organizations. I think you must have joined all these organizations and never stopped paying your dues. Well, you 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 you're living. Well, I <laughs> see. And then you, you, I mean, there's just so much. If this book fleshed out every single one of these honorary degrees and government commissions and, and these important dates in your history, it would be like a set of encyclopedias. And I don't even know how you can remember all these things. I can't. That's why they're in the book. <laughs> <laughs> to remind even you. Well, I thank you so much, Dr. Burroughs, for getting on this show because I've been wanting to have you to come on and talk about your experiences and, and to encourage other people because one thing I know about you is that you are very supportive and you will, in, you will offer to help and give advice to anyone who asks you. Well, I would like to thank you, Glow, and I'm very proud of you and the fact that you are one of my students and I am a part of you. you know, you, I'm, I'm in you. And so I'm very proud of you and the wonderful work that you, you're doing and have been doing. And I want to welcome you into the club of the retirees. Well, I'm happy mm. to be a retiree, but <laughs> if I'm going to grow up to be like you, I can't look, sit. Look, you're going to find yourself busier now than when you were working. I'm sure I will, mm. and I don't mind But you'll it. enjoy it. I don't mm. mind it one bit. It's mm. been so nice to chat with you, Dr. Burroughs. And I, I hope you much success on your book. Uh, remember, there's a positive in every negative. Think. Concentrate. That's Discover right. all the positive and negative, and don't mess with Mr. In-Between. That's Dr. it. Dr. Margaret mm -hmm. Taylor Goss Burroughs, Life with Margaret. Thank you mm -hmm. so much, Thank you, Dr. dear. Burroughs. Thank you. Mm -hmm.